something wonderful, something really wonderful is happening. Now, I don't know if you can feel it. Maybe you can't feel it, but I do. And I've been feeling the presence of God all afternoon. How many of you have been kind of in a little bubble of the Holy Ghost today? Let's see your hands. Yeah, Kathy, it's kind of like this morning didn't leave. It just kind of lingered and lingered and lingered, and now you're here again. And, and it's like, um, you know, when I first uh, got started in ministry, I'm going to share this little story. But when I first got started in ministry after about two, two years or so, um, I, I was on TV the very first time ever. And uh, the guy wanted to interview me really well. He said, I don't, he said, I don't like fruitcakes and I don't want people that get on and say wrong things and do things wrong. So um, I want to interview you so I know when you get on TV that we're going to be serious. And I said, okay, fine. And so um, we get on. He said, now it's live. So once we get on there, there's no changing. We can't change it. It's live. And I just want to let you know, I'm not trying to make you nervous, Sister Joan, but we're going to be on coast to coast from New York to San Francisco, the whole United States. And I was like, Ugh. but anyway, so I get on there and he says, I'll never forget this as long as I live. He goes, uh, so Sister Joan, because we practice this a little bit behind what they call a green room. And he says, so Sister Joan, could you explain your ministry to us? And clear out of the blue, this is what comes out of my mouth. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. This is my handle, this is my stout. Uh, what, what's that thing? Spout. And uh, tip me over and pour me out. And I'm looking into the monitors of the TV and I see myself like this and I'm going, oh my God. Oh, my God, where did that come from? So the man that has interviewed me is looking at me like, oh, my God, we spent a whole hour going over this so we wouldn't have a fruitcake on our show. And he goes, well, Sister Joan, would you like to explain to all our audience what that little nursery rhyme means? <laughs> and so I didn't know. So I go, Holy Spirit. Because I just want to teach you something about tonight and walking in miracles and what I'm going to pray for you tonight. You see, you all need the helper. You can't do a thing. You see, when you think it's you doing it, you're, you're in trouble. But when you know that the helper, the Holy Spirit, will be with you always, always. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. That's why Jesus said to the apostles, don't go anything. Uh, I'm going to send the helper the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. That's why we can say that the kingdom of God is inside of me. The kingdom of God is inside each of you. The kingdom of God is in you because you have connection, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all three of them are moving for you. And whatever you do, you're never alone. And you'll never be orphans. You'll never be forsaken. And so I quickly said, because, uh, you know, I'm looking at myself in the monitor kind of strange and and i'm like i don't even know why i sang that nursery, nursery rhyme and i and i just quickly because the guy's asking me so what does it mean and i went help holy spirit help and all of a sudden this came out of my mouth the church is filled right here the church oh god mm -mm. the church is full of gifts anointings, pastors, evangelists. The church is full of Sunday school teachers and singers and writers and people that do this and do that. Every one of you have gifts. Every one of you have gifts. And I'm saying this to the guy, and I said, and so my, I said, the ministry I have is to take the teapot and just take those people that have been full of the Holy Spirit, the people in these churches that have sit sometimes, they're, maybe they're in their 80s and they've sat in church and sat in church, and maybe they're only 14 or maybe they're 9, and we, they've just sat in church, and, and, and you have already anointed them, chosen them, and equipped them, and, and they have you in them, and you're in them, and they're in you, and, and they don't even know that they can be tipped out and poured as a 
drink offering and just pour it out there, pour it out there to where people need people and people have needs and they pour out because it's time for us to pour ourselves out. And then I went into, you know, when Jesus came to the well and he started talking to the woman at the well, he said, out of your innermost being, I have water you know not of. And she said, give me a drink of that so I don't have to come here and draw and be persecuted by all the other women. She said, I have water you know not of. I want some of that. And it's living water. So what happens, and I want to share because I'm going to get into my message in a minute. Okay, this is just extra. This is a setup start. Okay, this is just... um, So what happens is sometimes your well gets a little plugged up you know what i'm saying now in the old days they used to have these pumps and they used to have to prime them okay so they had these old type pumps i remember that first time i went to go see one uh, grandma uh in utah they didn't have running water and they didn't have um we had outhouses and you had to go outside and get water and you had to keep going like this and going like this and going like this and pretty soon the water would start coming out of the end of it. So what I'm saying is it took a lot of effort, are you hearing me, to push that pump. I was just a little girl, I think I was nine, ten years old, pushing that pump. But I realized it took effort. So what I'm saying is it's for us to go to revival, we have to push that pump a little bit and that pump is like prayer and intercession and fasting and seeking god and walking and praying and being in the word and that starts that pump and then when you get out and start evangelizing like we have this week you start evangelizing and all of a sudden a little spurt comes out out on the streets or a little spurt comes out if you go to the nursing home. And a little spurt comes out. And you go, wow, that feels really good. So you give it another pump and pretty soon it's, it's a whole cup. Pretty soon it's a whole teapot. And pretty soon it becomes a little more and a little more. You're saying, where are you going with this, Sister Jonesy? I had no idea to say this tonight. It's just coming. Okay, so it goes right with my message too. Uh, isn't that amazing how the Holy Spirit does that? <laughs> like it. And so... What happens is if your water starts coming out of you, out of your innermost being, and yours comes out, and yours comes out, and yours comes out, and and over there comes out, and over there in the back comes out, and you come out, and, and then you guys starts coming out and it starts going faster and faster, then it becomes a trickle, 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 trickle. And when they all unite together, When they all unite together, it becomes a flood. So what I'm saying is, if we would all unite together, and one of the keys for revival is, you have to get people that are like spirits. Are you hearing me? You have to get people with the like spirits that are willing to become a flood. So if you all work together, it becomes a flood. Because your little trickle has some power, but it doesn't have the power if it's, you know, uh, I would love it. Like, I would love to have, I would love to do this someday. But I probably would be up in the air if I did. I've always wanted to take one of those big fire hoses that they have and um, blast somebody with it. Now, I know that doesn't sound good, but, you know, I have a feeling that if I had the power that comes out of those fire hoses, that it, that I probably couldn't control it, and I'd be all over the place because it has so much force. And what I'm saying is, when we all join our anointings, our callings, and walk together, the key for revival is unity and love. You know, Catherine Kuhlman one time went into a meeting, and uh, because there was so much strife, she went in and she couldn't feel the presence of God. She just said, bye, and left. Because, you know what, it's really hard to minister where there's, but I'm telling you, Pastor Mike, you have a combination here that I have, I've known you now a long time, but you have a combination in your church right now. And you guys have to be careful, okay? Because when you're on the verge of revival, and you are on the verge of revival, because you have a body of Christ right now that loves each other, okay? When you don't have strife and and bickering and talking bad about each other and doing stuff wrong 
and you all walk together in love, that is an ap absolute conduit for revival. And when all the different gifts, because see, Pastor Mike, he's now saying, bring the ministry team up and let this one do that and let this one do that. I, I really admire what you've done, Pastor. I asked if the girls could do Sunday school and you said, let me check with my Sunday school leader. Do you know how many pastors would not do that? Because you put the man in position or a woman in position. I don't know if it's a guy or a girl. And you said, let me check with them. So you, even though you're the pastor of the house, if you put somebody in a position, you check with them. This keeps peace. And you have your staff come together because this is the key. Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that tonight's anointing will touch these people. I pray, oh God. I pray for a transference of anointing. And Lord, but not my anointing. I, I, I don't want that. People have asked me, can you pray for me, John G. Lake's anointing or so-and-so's anointing? I said, no. You don't want me. You don't want my anointing. I don't have it. I can't give it to you. I can't give you John G. Lake's anointing. I mean, there's some fruitcake things out there. And if I told you who did it, uh, you'd all know who they are. I've, I mean, there's some real fruitcakes out there that are really big name ministers that went and laid on Catherine Kuhlman's grave to get her anointing and went and laid on uh, John G. Lake's, uh, you know, come on. And you know what I say? I have it in my book, my new book that Pastor Mike's going to help me with because he's going to show me how to do it so I get it out. But in my new book, it's got John G. Lake sermons in it and some other uh, my teachings in it. And, and I, say to, I say, why would you want John G. Lake's anointing? Why would you want Catherine Kuhlman's anointing? Why would you want Rhea Wood Edwards? Why don't you ask for Jesus' anointing? Why don't you ask for God's mantle? Why don't you ask? Why do you settle for less? Why do you settle for less? Just ask God, anoint me. And tonight, <laughs> tonight, God told me, you're going to pray in a, a mantle on him from heaven. Nothing to do with me. It's going to be all God. So go with me in your Bibles. Woo. Psalms 133. Some of you know me, some of you don't know me, but I want you to know that years ago, God gave me a vision. It's called God is Taking a City. And in this vision that God had given me, it was a five-hour long vision, and it was churches working together in unity. Because nobody can take a city. And what the problem is, my church can do it, 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 come on. You're not going to take a city with one church. You're not going to take any city with one church. There's got to be a day coming when the anointing and the churches will work together. All right? So I'm going to read this to you. Because Jesus' last prayer in John 17, Jesus' last prayer. Do you know when somebody's going to leave or die, the last things they say to you is the most important thing for, for you to, to get? His last prayer was, Father, that they be in me and as I am in you. And not just for them, he says. Not do I just pray for them. But I pray for those that believe this because of their word, which is you. We've read the Bible. We've read John 17. Where Jesus' last prayer is that they're in the world, but not of the world. Protect them from the world and let them be one, connected. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What do you think it means in John's, John 15? I am the vine, you are the branches. And, and he says you stay connected. You can do nothing without Christ. You can do nothing without the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so people ask, how does the anointing come? You get a team of people... And what I'm saying to Pastors Mike and all of you, you have a, a group of people here, and maybe not all of you, but you're coming along. All you need is a little group to get the motion going that is going to make a covenant with each other. We're going to stay in fellowship. We're going to stay in prayer. We're going to keep on doing this. We're going to, one vision. Don't worry about that stupid thing. Just turn it off. It's annoying me. 
And it doesn't matter if it gets, I'm sorry for those of you that will watch part of it. Bye. I know I can't help it, but, you know, I, I'm flowing in the spirit, and I don't want to see P- her get him, and then she's fussing with it. Just leave it. Because when you're flowing, you can't, you can't have people doing this kind of stuff, walking around and making noise. And You know, one time I was at a Benny Hinn meeting, and I felt so sorry for the lady that was on the camera. I mean, he yelled at her, and it was like, whoa, you know. But anyway, so I'm not trying to be rude. And I'm not Benny Hinn, and I'm not trying to be rude either, but i got to flow. So unity is the key. So let's read this together. And so God gave me that vision and bringing churches together in unity, and I've been trying to do it for 30 years. And Pastor uh, Sister Norma Rice, that used to be my accountant, finally said to me one day, she said, Sister Joan, you have spent thousands and thousands of dollars, because some of you know I used to have a $2 million business. That doesn't mean I had $2 million. That does, that's not how it works. When you have a $2 million, that just means that's what we sold. That They didn't let me have every cent of every product I sold. They just gave me a small percentage, which was still pretty big. But she kept making fun of me and saying, you, you know... You, you know what, Joan? You're spending too much money sending packets and packets, and I'd get up at Buddy Harrison's, and I'd get up at this one, and I'd get up at different conferences, and I'd ask if I could talk. I got up at Gerald Durstein's, and I'd get up here and there, and I'd get up and give them all free packets on how to take their cities. And then I went and met some of the key people that are well-known, if I told you their names, and they just looked at me and said, Sister Joan, are you out of your mind? I go, why? They says, you'll never get these churches to work together. But you know what? That's a lie. That's a lie. So it doesn't matter if you get a whole bunch of people to work together or just a handful to work together. You follow? So you have enough people in this church that will walk in love and perfect unity with one vision, you have to have a clear vision like it says in Habakkuk. You have to know the vision, press for the vision, and everyone in the church or the congregation or the city, depending on how you're doing it, will have that same focus and that same vision. That's what happened at Azusa Street. They all, there was a small group. It wasn't a big group. A small group that got in unity and unity. Psalms one. 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It is like precious oil upon the beard, running down the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garment, and like the dew of Hermon descending upon Mount Zion. For there the Lord commands a blessing evermore. So what happens, we want to see revival. We truly want to see revival. But when we get in unity, it says it's like precious oil. Okay. So, you know, if you just put a little oil on your forehead, you just got a little oil. But this says if you stay in unity, you're going to be saturated in oil. Pretty soon it's going to run down your head. Pretty soon it's going to run on to the people around you. Pretty soon it's going to run on the Sunday school teachers. Pretty soon it's going to run on the next church. Pretty soon it's going to run on the evangelism team and the nursery team and this team and the ones that watch the babies. And pretty soon that anointing is going to run down until that, that, that anointing is on every member of the church. And if it's citywide, then it starts running off on the other people and the other people. And then you have revival. But it takes love. And unity, and no strife, and bickering, unity, because it's precious to God. Go with me to Chronicles, Chronicles, Second Chronicles. And I, I wasn't going to read this because I don't know how to say these, these names. So anyway, when I get to it, I'll just have to do whatever I normally do. Okay, Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter 5, verse 12. And the Levites who were the singers, all of those of whoever that is and whoever that guy is and whoever that guy is, so because I don't know how to say their names, with the sons of their brethren stood at the east of the altar, clothed in white linen, 
having cymbals and strings, instruments, and harps with them. 120 priests sounded with the trumpet. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard giving thanks to the Lord. They lifted up their voices with a trumpet and cymbals and strings and music and praised the Lord saying, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. And the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not continue to minister because the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house. Now I want to say we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and you can get so that you are a carrier, a carrier of that's my heart cry. Am I there? Nope. And why aren't you there, Sister Joan? Well, should I lie to you or should I be honest with you? What do you want? Honest. God has showed me many, many times what this ministry could be like. And, I, and he tells me what I have to do. He's told me many, many times what I have to do to make it happen. But I'm having some real problems with the flesh. He tells me how, how you should do this and you should fast and you should do this and you need to do this and you do do that. And um, first I used to be like, well, if I had never gotten married, I, it would have been fine. No, no. Then the Lord said, no, you can't blame your husband. He lets you do whatever you want to do. He lets you travel where you want to. And if you asked your husband if you could go to the mountains and get a hotel for a week and fast, he would say, go for it. He didn't maybe even go to it. Because when Marty and I first got married, the first thing we did, our very first Christmas as a married couple, and we had a little, uh, uh, anyway, when we got married, a little whew, friction hitting us, that Marty said to me, you told me a story about this Pearl Mountain, and can you go there and just fast? And I went, yes. It was Youngie Cho. Youngie Cho has a Pearl Mountain. He has them here and there and everywhere, but he has one in Santa Cruz Mountains. It's Mount Hermon, actually. It's on Mount Hermon, the little cabins. And so our first Christmas that Marty and I had together is we went fast. They made the men go to one section of the hill, and they made the women go to another section, and you could stay in a cabin. Marty had his cabin way on that end, uh, on the top, top part of the hill. I had my, we had, the women had a cabin over here, but we each had our own cabin. But we weren't supposed to fellowship, although once in a while I saw him walking around praying I'd like, like that. But we weren't supposed to communicate or even talk to each other. That's when I got bad poison oak because I went outside one time. to, to They were having a fire, so I decided to go sit by the fire because I was chilly. And uh, it was poison oak they were burning anyway. Um, that's a whole other story. But we fasted. What a way to start your wedding. Fasting. For three days. But what I'm saying is, sometimes it's hard to make your flesh do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. You could be here if you would do this. And I, I know, I know, I know. That's why, uh, I know it sounds funny, but the other night we were talking about it because it was my birthday. And I said, um, they were talking about, you know, and I got blonde hair and I'm getting older. But I saw a vision of me when I was in my uh, 20, like 25, 26 no, it must have been older. It must have been 30. And I saw this vision, and the Lord showed me a vision of me preaching in the Colosseum. And I was blonde. I'm not really blonde. I never would have been blonde. It's all Marty's fault. He made me go blonde. But anyway, I was blonde, and I was skinny. And I was pointing up, and people were screaming and getting healed. So the Lord says, you're still not skinny. And so someday when you get skinny, because you're going to fast and pray more, then, the, then I'll start opening up those coliseums to you. I still have the vision, but I was old in the vision. But see, I have to be obedient all the way. So you could actually hinder, and you're saying, I told you I'd be honest, didn't I? You need to hear what I'm saying. If I can get control of my Snickers and my coffee and uh, chips and junk food... Not only would I be healthier, but I would actually get to that point where God showed me my vision and my future. 
You follow what I'm saying? So, you know, you have a future as a church. You have a future as a person. And God will give you the step. I love what Pastor Mike said this morning. It's one baby step and then another baby step. It's not going to happen overnight. You know, the longest I fasted was 21 days, but, and that's it. And then sometimes I fasted for a whole year, like two days every, every week for a year. But, you know, it's unity. And so here's 120. It's very important that it says, it says that there was 120. 100, 120 priests were marching in, blowing their trumpets, and the glory of God was so strong that they couldn't continue playing, blowing their horns or playing any of their instruments because the glory of God was so strong. Do you think that, that the Old Testament is more powerful than the New Testament? No. When's the last time you had an angel just unlock the prison door and say, come on, Peter, get out there and preach the way this eternal life? Peter raised people from the dead. Paul had miracles. It's all in the New Testament that angels will visit us and angels will work with us and angels will do things with us. And so there was 120 there and, and God had a wonderful time with those 120. And then Solomon, he, verse, chapter 7, verse 1. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice and the glory of the Lord filled the temple and the priest could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the house. When all the children of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed, no, 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 they bowed, their faces to the ground, not just on the ground, but to the pavement, and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. When's the last time that you just got your face right down on the carpet till you're hugging the carpet? And I'm not talking about a minute or two. I want to share what happened just a few uh, months ago. A month ago, yeah. I guess it was a month ago. Well, maybe it's been two now. Time goes so fast when you're traveling. I just did a... In fact, it birthed, it birthed a tent revival. We'll be doing a tent revival in less than 20 days, actually, because of this being birthed. So I met some people because of Pastor Sandra. And I, went, I met these people, and they invited me to come preach in their mountain uh, retreat. Now, the mountain retreat is where you go up there and, and you don't even have to leave, you know, because it's not like you, the power of God hits and then you have to go home and take care of business and watch TV and cook a meal and wash some clothes or whatever. No, no, you're there for three four solid days, morning, afternoon, evening, early prayer, late prayer, fellowship, unity, 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 unity for the whole weekend. And, and, you know, I didn't really know them, and they kind of said, just kind of do what you want. So I didn't know what they meant. They said, really, you kind of just took over. And I said, oh, well, you said I could do what I wanted. So anyway, so now we're really good friends. We had a little bit of, uh, 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 but anyway, it's fine. Because, um, you know, when you go and somebody says, do whatever you want to, and you don't even know them, you don't even know what they believe in yet. But... What happened is, the, because we were staying focused and staying focused, that by the, the end of the meetings, like three a day, four a day, and it, it got powerful and powerful, that the last night, it was so awesome. When I started to pray for them, there was only about 120 people there or something like that. Um, actually, that's about what it was. No, I don't think it was 120, maybe 100. Um, but anyway, they, they, they were on the floor, and then they started screaming. I mean, not one. Not one, all of them, in sync. Are you hearing me? In unity. I mean, how did that happen? In unity, all of a sudden, this whole group that's out on the floor, laid out on their backs, some of them, they're on their knees, and some of them are kissing the pavement. Some are on their bellies, just like that, with their faces right in the floor. And they started screaming. And, and the, they started in travail, 
so that the, the, the Holy Spirit was so strong in them that it's, they were praying in tongues, but it was like groaning. And it was like they were lifting up and down off the floor. And even some of them on their back were just lifting up, lifting up. And all of them started screaming all at the same time in accord. Save our area. Save. Cause revival fires. Save our families. Save our children. Save our neighbors. Save. And they started screaming for souls. And it went on for hours and hours and hours. And I said, wow, God, I haven't seen this for a while. I said, what's going on, Lord? He said, they're hungry. They're desperate. They're hungry. And when people get desperate and hungry, God sees their heart from heaven. He sees their heart. And he has fire. <sighs> has fire come down and gets a hold of these dead bones and rises them up and makes them on fire and fire of, of revival starts going inside of you and you can't contain the fire because God's an all-consuming fire. fire fire's right fire and you know like a regular fire it spreads it spreads like wildfire so it spread from there to another church and i never met that pastor and we didn't even get him a pastor packet so he didn't even know what to do he didn't even know we we didn't have time the next week they i had a few days open i went over there i have no idea what happened i went to pray for people the whole church hundred something people and they had the place so crowded because of that revival that happened there they all heard that i was going to be over here in Coeur d'Alene and that place was so packed you couldn't hold them they were in the ba in the hallways in the in, in the bookstore here there crammed 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 and then I prayed for everybody and prayed for everybody and and then I prayed for the pastor he went down and when I got through praying for everybody the only one I hadn't prayed for is the lady on the keyboard all the rest fell out the guitar lady when I went to pray for her she just went blue I never even got near her but what happened is the pastor was out he never got up and I didn't know the pastor I mean I barely met him for a few minutes before the service started and he said take liberty well He's on the floor over there hugging the floor. I mean, literally kissing the rug. So when everything got done, everybody's on the floor, and I, I'm standing there with, looking at the musician, and she's still playing. And I said, well, usually at this point, the pastor comes up and takes an offering, but I don't know what's going on, so I'm just going to sit down. I just sat down and waited till everybody started getting up. But Why? Why would that happen there? Why can't that happen here? Why can't it happen everywhere? But it spread. So it spread from that to let's have a meeting to see how many people will show up for the tent. Now, I'm a little concerned about this tent thing. Okay, because it's like, I don't know. But I'm going to have to do some heavy-duty praying because I know one thing. If God begins a good work... And I know it because you guys came up with finances for this tent meeting. And, and it's, it, let me tell you, it looked this way, like it was just going to fall apart, wobble, wobble, wobble. But since I've been here, the money's all come in. The driver showed up. I got the truck to get it done. I got the people to put it up. This one group decided they didn't want to help put up the tent. They said they had 35 men. I, I called and they said, we don't have them. We have someplace else we have to be. And I'm going, look, the tent meeting's in less than 20 days. or tw It's a 27. The tent goes up on the 20, whatever. I have one more week's revival. I go home for a day or two, leave again, come back next day, tent meeting. But I got on the phone here a few afternoons. And we got 25 guys that said, we'll do it. So it's all coming together. You see, sometimes when God tells you to do something, you just, it looks like it's, ooh, this is not coming together. This doesn't look like it's unity. This looks like it's falling apart. But if you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing. You see, I learned one thing a long, long time ago, that when you put your hand to the plow, you don't ever back up. Now, that doesn't mean it's not going to be hard sometimes. You might have a big boulder there, and you're pushing with that plow and pushing. You just keep, keep rocking it. You, you, might, you, you might be stuck for a while. You know, you're, you're probably saying, Pastor Mike, I wish this had happened 20 years ago, and you might have been stuck at that little boulder, and you've been hitting at it and hitting at it and hitting at it, and God is going to honor it, Pastor Mike. 
you are going to have a revival break forth in this building through these people that you have now. Because the time is ripe for such a time as this. So then we know that there was 120 and the fire came down from heaven. Where else did we see 120? We see 120 in the book of Acts. So go with me to Acts. Acts, Acts, Acts. In Acts we see, where is Acts? Somewhere in here. You put a marker somewhere on Acts? You must have not. Oh, there must be Acts. Nope, that's Malachi. Nope, Acts is here. Okay. So we know on the day of Pentecost, they were all in one place in one accord again. Unity, are you hearing me? They're in one place, one purpose, in unity. Unity and love is the key for revival. I'm telling you, unity and persistence keep that boulder going. And it said they were all in one place. One, verse one, chapter two, verse one. And the day of Pentecost had fully come. They were all in one accord, in one place, so that means they were in one place, but they were all in total agreement. And suddenly a sound from heaven came like a rushing mighty wind and filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them as divided tongues of fire. And it came upon each of them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in tongues. Peter then gets up and preaches this great message about Joel verse uh, 17 and in the last days it shall come to pass saith the lord i will pour my spirit on all flesh your sons your daughters shall prophesy and that's about time too so that means i'm going to use children i'm going to use older people i'm going to use everybody so you're going to be shocked when this revival happens who god's going to use you know i just had a me i had a tent revival in um New York, upstate New York a long time ago. And the Holy Spirit said, tonight you're not preaching. You're going to have the children pray for everybody. I had it happen again at another tent meeting. At that tent meeting, I, I mean, I, that, we had all the little children come up, five years old, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I called, we had called out people, word of knowledge, word of knowledge, word of knowledge. And I had them all line up on a line, just like you do here. And I had the little kids lay hands on them. I said, okay, kids. All right, children. Go ahead and pray for him. And you know, it was amazing. You see this six-foot guy. Uh, and I'll never forget this one. This six-foot guy, when he, this little girl, she was nine, started to pray for him, he started growling at her. <laughs> and I was like, uh-oh, I need to get over there and help her. And the Holy Spirit said, no, she's got it under control. And I went, she's only nine. It's a demon. And that little girl went like this. I called you to come out of him now in the name of Jesus. He went boom, boom. And the demons are coming out. She's standing over the top of, I said, I have power in the name of Jesus. And I'm thinking, man, this little girl knows what she's doing. The man got set free. Other little five-year-olds were going to one another. Did you feel that? Something came out of my hands. And the people, they couldn't even reach. They'd touch their stomach and they'd go, ploop. I mean, we're not talking about pushing them with the head, you know, here. You know, we're talking about bloom, bloom, bloom. And I was like, wow. So God's going to use old people, young people, when we come together in unity and get so we're hungry. I said, God, what is this that happened in Spokane? When I did that meeting, that's now turned from that meeting to this meeting to now a tent meeting. What is it, God? He says, they're hungry. They're hungry. I pray to God that that tent meeting explodes with the power of God. Because it's just creep face. I know who's behind all this craziness that's happening. It's not the pastor's. His creep face. You know, he don't want it to happen. So he's trying to block here and block here and block here. But I just keep pushing on that boulder. Just keep pushing on that boulder. P keep pushing on that boulder. Believing. We're going to see a great harvest of souls. So on the day of Pentecost, Peter gets up and he starts preaching under the anointing. Are you hearing me? The body of Christ is sick and tired of church. You know, Marty and I did a tent meeting, uh, not a tent meeting. We were asked to do a meeting in 
Hermiston, Oregon, kind of where we're going to be living now. And uh, it was the dead of winter, and there was a blizzard. So it took, we had to go 300 miles, um, yeah, 200 miles, and they wouldn't let us take our RV in there because of uh, the roads, and they, they stopped all semis and all, if, unless you had snow tires, and they wouldn't let you take an RV or a semi through. But we did this revival. What very many people showed up because of the blizzards and stuff. But I remember after I got through preaching, I went and sat on the front seat right here. Like, oh, that's off. Good. I sat like this, and these little girls came over to me. They'd been on the floor. They'd been laid on the floor on their backs. They'd been out under the power. Five-year-olds and a four-year-old. They were both laying there. I don't know if they were sisters or just friends. And they came over after they got off the floor, and they were, <gasps> Sister Joan. It's one of those churches where everybody says, Sister, Brother, you know, that kind of church. And, um, and Sister Joan, it was so cute. The little girl, five-year-old says, Sister Joan, I've been a Christian my whole life and never felt the power of God until today. Now I know God is real. So I said, would you like the Holy Spirit? And they both of them, I don't know what it is. I said, boom, they started speaking in tongues. And that's something they'd been a Christian their whole life. And they had never felt the presence of God. How many people have been Christians their whole life? Come on. How many people have been in church their entire life and never felt the presence of God like what I'm talking about now? You see, it's the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. No anointing. You go to church, go home the same. Come back, go back home, back and forth. A year, two years, five years, ten years. You see, when the man at the pool, the pool of Bethesda was laying there, he'd been carried there by his parents for 38 years. Is that right? 38 years. You know, it was easy to carry him when he was a year old or six months old. Then it was a little harder to carry him all the time when he got bigger. Then he was eight. He's kind of hard to carry. When he was 14, hard to carry. Then when he got to be 20, you'd think after 20 years of taking him, getting him dressed, dragging him on a stretcher or however they did it, and take him to the pool, waiting for the stirring of the water, you'd think that the parents would give up after 20 years. I mean, every day, every day, dragging this crippled kid, child. Now he's not a child anymore. Pretty soon he's a grown-up, and now he's in his 30s. And somebody always steps in before he, he can. So it's like hopeless. But they keep still taking him. That's faith. That's faith. When you can say, we've been here at Jesus as Lord all these years. We're waiting for a revival. We're waiting for revival. We're waiting for revival. And we're going to see revival. One day it's going to happen. And it's going to happen just like on the day of Pentecost. And suddenly, suddenly, off guard, they didn't know what was going to happen. Just suddenly, a mighty rushing wind came in. And all of a sudden, they got full of the Holy Spirit, preached a sermon. 3,000 people got saved. And then 5,000 more get saved. And then just people got saved. And it's, it's happened. That's how it's going to happen. That's how it's going to happen. It's going to happen suddenly. And you know what God's doing right now? I just want to let you know what God's doing right now. The eyes of the Lord are going to and fro saying, that one, that one. Now, why didn't he say that one or that one? He goes, I'm looking for those that are sold out. I'm looking for Gideon's army. I'm looking, the eyes of the Lord know what's going on in you. Are you going to be a vessel ready to be used. If not, if you're going to lap the water up, he's going to say, it don't matter. You see, I want to let you know, God can use anybody he wants to. One time we tried to do outreach in uh, Gerber, when we lived in Gerber. We couldn't get nobody to help us. So Marty and I did it all. Him and me, just two of us, Joan and Marty. We put out 3,000 flyers. Took us a week. We did all the work and got it all done. Went out to set the stuff up. Had no one to help us. Some guy in the park just came over and said, what are you guys doing? Looks like it's hard. I said, well, could you use some help? Yep. So now we have three people, me and Marty. 
And I was getting disappointed a little bit. I'm just being honest. I started to sprinkle. I went, oh, honey, it's going to sprinkle and mess it. He said, trust God, honey. Don't even look at the weather. I said, it's going to mess. He says, oh, don't say that. He said, just keep putting it out on the wet lawn. Just keep putting the stuff out. We're doing this outreach. Just keep setting it up. All of a sudden, there comes the sun. And I said, well, honey, it's supposed to have started five minutes ago. And he says, yeah, I know. I said, but I, I don't know what. Maybe I was just having a bad day that day, and I, I was just, I mean, it was Marty's faith. Believe me. Sometimes I just need Marty's faith. And he says, watch, they're going to start coming. And you know what? Within the next 15 minutes, we had three or 400 people there. And 75 people got saved, and then we, they all helped out clean the place up. And three hours later, it was like, wow, look what God can do with just a few. So God's looking. Will you be one of them that God will use for the revival that's going to hit all around the world? So they got saved. Kathy, can you come up, please? And start playing on the keyboard. You're saying you didn't preach very long. Yeah, because I'm going to share another story. I love these stories. You know, I just want to share with you that uh, Leighton Smith, he's, he's with Jesus now. He asked me, to, I'm going to tell two stories actually. They're both with the same pastor. Leighton Smith I asked if I could bring a missionary team. I don't ever want to do what I did that trip ever again. So I planned a missionary trip to New York, New York City, Manhattan. All right. And on that missionary trip, Val was the missions coordinator, Val and Mary Jo. We had 54 people on the mission trip to New York. We had no cars to take us anywhere. Are you ready? So I had two people go a couple weeks early and learn all the train routes, the subway routes, the bus routes. And we went all over New York, Brooklyn, Bronx, you name it. That's how I met Pastor Norma. And we learned how to do it. The only one that got lost on one of the subway trains was me after we had all the charts. But I want to share with you that one of the outreaches, we did several outreaches, and we had angels show up at the last outreach. A legion of angels showed up at the last reach. So one of the outreaches we did was we set up a PA system on Wall Street, downtown Manhattan, on Wall Street. We got permit a permit and had a keyboard and a loudspeaker that would, the speaker was one of those huge rock concert speakers. And because the buildings are so straight up, the sound would stay into the, uh, the sound would just go down in all these streets, like about a five, six block radius. And, uh, and right here uh, on the corner, across the street is what George Washington man, man, uh, Monument with um, steps going up to the big statue of George Washington. And on the corner, we're right on the corner, is a big, we put a big banner up here behind us that said, Jesus is Lord, and uh, had a picture of Jesus or something. And so they're playing the keyboard, and then I had different ones sharing their testimony and sharing their testimony. Well, this model guy has these two models, and he's taking pictures with his camera. And he thinks that he wants to get his sexy models. He thought it would be cute in his magazine or his papers to have them model with this huge sign that says, Jesus is Lord, right? So he tells his models, he's got all the camera equipment and these lights and stuff, and he says, just stand there, get under where it says that. He says, now give me a sexy pose. Give me a sexy pose. Well, the anointing was so strong that they, these two models went, no. So you want to keep your job? I told you to give me a little. They said, no. These are Christians. See, that sign says, Jesus, we're not going to do it. If you don't do it, you're going to lose your job. Well, fire us then, because the Holy Ghost conviction, these two girls were not Christians. The Holy Ghost conviction got on them.
because the music was so annoying. Remember what I said, the first scripture I read about that they came with the horns and the, and the cymbals and the music, and we had praise and worship so loud that everywhere for blocks and blocks and blocks, Marty went up and started witnessing it. He, sometimes I wonder about Marty. I love him so dearly. He actually went in the Catholic Church and started handing everybody tracks, and the priest came out and told him he couldn't do it inside the church. And I, I said, he said, well, I'm going to do it outside. Anyway, he got kicked out. But anyway, but listen to unity. Want to hear the unity? Pastor Layton had some other churches working with him. There we have a couple of churches in unity. We had 54 people on the mission trip with me from all different parts of the United States. In fact, one of the stories is so neat, and I didn't even know it till they got there. A man came to me at, up, up at Christian Retreat in Strawberry Lake, Gerald Durstein's, and he said to me, can we take children on the mission trip? I said, as long as you take care of them. I said, I'm not going to babysit your children. And you know you're going to New York. Could be dangerous. He said, I have seven children. There's seven of us. Now, we had a fee that they all had to pay. Well, when you have seven kids and you have to all pay a hundred and something dollars for that week, that's a lot of money. Plus, you have all these plane, uh, plane tickets, right? And so I didn't know. He got the plane tickets. He came. We let him have, uh, we all slept on the floor. I know you're saying, really? Hotels? Oh, no. We slept on the floor. All the women, 35 of us on the bottom basement of the church with two showers that worked on air mattress, mine kept going flat every night. And you know what? When you have 15 of them, <laughs> it was awful. So you didn't get a whole lot of sleep. But one night when I had them share their testimony, this is what they said. I could not believe what I heard. We have been saving for years. The mother's the one that shared the testimony and then the kids all got to share. We've been saving for years as a family to go to Disney World in Florida because the children wanted to do that. But I just recently was pregnant and I lost my little baby boy. The baby was born still dead or whatever, uh, however. Anyway, the baby was born <coughs> dead. And we as a family made a decision in unity do we want to go to Disneyland, Disney World, or should we use the money we've been saving for all these years to go with Sister Joan and share Jesus in honor of our dead little brother? And they came. And every one of them witnessed and shared, and it was awesome. You see, that's when you have somebody that says, I care more about the things of God. You fear what I'm saying? You, you want revival, but do we care more about the things of God? I don't know what it cost that family, a fortune. But, you know, they taught that family. They witnessed from the littlest one was four. And so we had unity. Let me go back. We had unity. We had 100, I mean, we had 135 people, Jews for Jesus, working with us on the streets. So we already had worked with them. They came. We had 54 in my team, Marty, with me. And so we spread out five blocks, 10 blocks, every direction. Now we have this big platform here, but Pastor, uh, Pastor Layton kind of was irritating the police, okay? Uh, he, did it, uh, he didn't mean to do it, but he did anyway. So he kept... The police kept coming over and saying, your volume is way too loud. You've got to lower it. So as soon as the police would leave, he'd crank it way back up again. And then they, they'd come back. Anyway, they had told him three or four times. And he kind of irritated them because he kept cranking it back up, which I'm glad he did. But so everybody, I was letting everybody on the team sing or do a uh, testimony. And so there was only like, I knew the pit permit was done at four, Okay. I knew the permit was going to, and the policeman said, because you won't listen to me right when 4 o'clock comes and your permit times, I'm going to be here to unplug this. And all of a sudden, I had somebody singing a wonderful song, and I, I, I looked at my watch, and I went, you know what? It's 5 to 4. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, get your, that lady to stop singing the song, and you get up there and preach, Joan, because I hadn't preached yet. 
at all. He said, move her over. I was like, she's in the middle of a song. Move her over. I went, God, this is really, br you know, she's, people are looking. I said, excuse me, I have to take the mic. And so Marty's looking at me like, what is my wife doing? And then he stared at me really weird the whole time I preached. Him and Pastor Layton were like, I mean, the whole time I'm preaching, I'm looking at my husband like he's, and Pastor Layton just staring at me. And I had no idea. They were giving me these really strange looks. So I started preaching. And I'll tell you what, when I preached that message, I don't know what happened to me, but it was not me. All of a sudden, when I got up there to preach, it was like everything on the streets went into slow motion. I don't know how to explain it. Exactly like what, like what happened to you. It's like everything was in slow motion, and it was like dead silence. And I knew it wasn't dead silence. And all of a sudden, I was doing the altar call and sharing Jesus. I did it for about 10 minutes. And I was right to the point. And the atmosphere in heaven was five and six blocks thick. And all of a sudden, when the lights started to change in New York, I mean, millions, hundreds of people were there. Nobody would change when the lights changed. And all of a sudden, as I'm doing the altar call, men with suitcases and suits on, and attache cases started dropping on their knees for blocks, dropping on their knees. And the police, right as I'm saying, dear Jesus, repeat after me, dear Jesus, come into my heart. That's as far as I got. Plug. And I couldn't finish the prayer. You couldn't hear one sound further than there. But you know what? I had over, almost 200 people out there. Well, 135 plus, I don't know, plus 54, whatever. I don't know math. Okay, I don't know a whole lot of stuff, really. I only have one gift, just one. One. I know how to do altar calls. That's it. And now I can write some books, but I don't really write books. But the Holy Spirit does. But anyway, so when the sound went off, all the people we had out there saw the people weeping on the road, people kneeling here and there and everywhere. They just started going to him and leading him to Jesus and leading him to Jesus. We had a whole, we had a whole army. That's what happens when you have unity. You have revival. The atmosphere of heaven was so thick uh, for blocks on the street that people were weeping and crying. And the and every the light must have changed five or six times and nobody crossed the streets. Busy, busy intersection. That's impossible in New York. Pretty soon the little girl comes over to me and she goes, I need to talk to you, Sister Joan, because we don't have a mic no more. I said, what? She said, my, my mom and I were over here across at the George Washington Monument. And my, my mom said to me in French, take me over to that lady. I want to give my heart to Jesus. And, and she said, I asked my mom, mom, how do you know what she said? She was speaking English. She said, no, she wasn't. She was speaking French. She said, no, she, and the little girl said, mom, she wasn't speaking French. She was speaking English. She said, I heard every word she said in French. So you take me over across the street so I can ask Jesus into my heart. So we went behind a hot dog stand on the curb, Marty and me, and the lady from France. And the little girl, she gave her heart to Jesus. You see, when you have revival, we had this happen another time too. A family called me one time when I was on Sky Angel and said, thank you so much, Sister Joan. My son, my son just got saved watching your TV program. And I said, really? And he says, yeah. I said, well, that's wonderful. He says, so thank you so much for signing because I was in the kitchen cooking, and he came in and was signing to me. I asked Jesus into my heart. I don't know how to sign. He said, I asked Jesus into my heart. And the, the mother said, how? He said, the lady on TV is telling me how to accept Jesus. And I said, I don't know how to sign. And she says, well, you have to know how to sign. My son, son said that you signed, and he wanted to accept Jesus, and he accepted Jesus with you as you signed him into the kingdom. We need... Revival. We need revival. And that was amazing, but I'm going to share one last thing. When 911 hit, we all saw it on TV. I saw it. I thought, actually, I thought Marty was watching an action movie, and then he said, This is real. I just happened to not be in New York, because I'm in New York an awful lot. Deb knows. 
I pretty much live. In fact, I have uh, somebody in New York that has a room for me, my own bathroom, my clothes stay there. In fact, Deb said she needed to wash them. They've been there, like, what, two years now? I guess I'll get them around to get washed. But anyway, I don't wear them that often, so they don't stink yet. But anyway, it's okay. I'll probably wash them when I get there in August. But anyway, so... So I'm, so when I saw it, the Holy Spirit told me to go. Now, Marty was not going to let me go. He said, honey, I know your heart. You just want to go there because you have such a heart of compassion. And he said, I'm not going to let you go. So that night, the Lord gave him a dream, came to Marty in a dream. And he said, I am, I am, I'm asking your wife to go. And I will protect, I mean, God came to Marty, said, I'll protect her, I'll watch over her, and she will be fine. And she will not go alone. I will have people to take care of her the whole time. Just let her go. Because I'm not going to argue with God, because this is the way it is. Women, women, if your husband don't let you do something, you can't argue with them. You go past them. So I went like this. God, if you want me to go, and I'm married to Marty, you're going to have to change Marty's heart because I'm not going to go anywhere without his blessings. Ever. My husband is really a mighty man of God. Some of you that know him, man, he is really. I mean, one time he blessed the food with some pastors and everybody at the table just started weeping and weeping and weeping. And he was just blessing the food. There's some kind of anointing on him. I mean, I, I know what it is. I told him, he says, oh, honey. I said, Charles Finney. He said, no way, honey. I said, you watch and see someday. But then the enemy's like t taking his throat away from him right now. But that's going to change too. But anyway, because he's stepping out. So anyway, Marty tells me that in the morning. Look what God does. Somebody calls me from New York. The Holy Spirit told me you're coming to New York. I'm supposed to take a couple of weeks off. And you who and whoever you bring you can stay at my house. You don't have to worry about where to stay. Then Mary Jo calls. Uh, the Holy Spirit told me you're going to New York. I'm going to get a flight and go with you. Then Becky calls. Then Val calls. So now I've got three people going with me, all coming from different parts of the United States. We can't fly yet because the airports are closed. But as soon as the, I mean, it's the first time I flew first class. No, it's, that's a lie. I flew first class one other time when somebody paid it for me. But when I got on the plane and in the airport, when the airport opened up, I was the only one on the plane. The only one on the plane, so the stewardess says, you can sit wherever you want if you want to sit. For you, anywhere on the plane, you have the whole plane. So I was like escorted, me the only passenger, to New York City. But when we got there, I asked Pastor Layton, same pastor years later, can I come down and get on your TV station and tell everybody to meet at your church so we can go around where the uh, city is, where the towers have collapsed and witness the people and go into the hospital where the ambulances are and I mean the fire the firemen were still I mean we we had a wonderful time it was awful I mean Pastor Layton had to slap me actually because I got in shock when you see dead bodies being pulled out and stuff like that I kind of got frozen and I had these people out with me to witness and he just walked up to me he must have saw that I was in shock and he didn't slap me too hard but and I was like he says, come on, sister, you got to shake up, get, get together. So I asked Pastor Layton if we could get on his radio uh, TV show. He says, yes. So all of us, I have, to, I have everybody taking me. So all, all of us are going to the TV show. And we're almost to the TV station. I knew where it was because I, I do TV there too. And uh, I'm almost there. And it's almost time to go on the air. He does this two-hour thing on the air. And uh, he calls and he says, where are you? And I'm thinking he's mad at me because I haven't got up there yet. I said, I'm almost there. I, we're, going, we're just parking. We're getting in the building. We're uh, going to get to the elevator. We'll be right up. He says, you've got to help me, Sister Joan. He said, we're stuck in traffic. I'm here with this African pastor that was supposed to do the two-hour show. So you've got to do it. And I went, what? He says, go up there quick. You've got five minutes to get on the air. Get up there. And I'm, so we're running up there. We go in, and I see all these phones. And I said, can we use the phones? And they said, yes. So we had, I had all these people with me. Get on that phone, that phone, that phone. I said, bring a phone up here. And supernaturally, supernaturally, I'm, they can see me on TV. I can't see them, right? 
then I'd say, Betty, so-and-so, you're standing in the kitchen with this color dress. You have this wrong with you, this wrong with you. I started, God supernaturally let me see into everybody's house, everybody's living room, what, it, whether they were in a car. I mean, it was like I saw, I don't know how to explain that. I saw this, and I saw that, and I started saying what I saw, and people started calling in. It was me. I'm totally healed. It's me. I'm totally healed. It's me. I'm healed. I'm healed. And people just started calling, and the phones were off the hook for, th for almost three hours because when we got through, they were still calling in. And then me not realizing what to do, I wasn't scheduled to preach at Pastor Layton's church. The African guy was supposed to preach. So I said, come over to Layton's church, and people will pray for you. I didn't mean I'd pray for them. But I got there, and we had the guy preach, and he, he got through at 10. And Pastor Layton said he's going to have me on the radio. So they head off to the radio station. He has a radio station called The Countdown that goes from 11 till 1 in the morning. He says, so as soon as you get through, you, you come over here. And so people are leaving. People are leaving the church because it's over, 10 o'clock. The service is over. All of a sudden, some people said, you said you'd pray for us. We came from TV today. And pretty soon another one, and another one, and another one. Pretty soon I have uh, 25 people up here, and I start praying for them. And so everybody that started to leave the church comes back in. Pretty soon I have 100 people in here now. It's like another service started. The service ended at 10, and the new one started at a quarter after. And I'm supposed to be on the radio. So it got to the point where somebody said, Joan, you're supposed to be on the radio. It's 11 o'clock, and I'm praying for people, praying for people. So it got to the point where, believe me, I just said, put your hands up to the Lord. And, and put your hands up to the Lord. Put your eyes on Jesus. And I ran over to the phone. I said, just stand there. I'll be right back. Hi, Pastor Layton. I can't go on the radio right now. He said, why? You're supposed to be on the air with me any minute. I said, because your church, I'm praying for people at your church. He goes, what are you talking about? Church was over at 10. I said, well, it restarted. No, it gets better. I couldn't get on at midnight because more people started coming. And then at 1 o'clock, more people started coming. But by, by 2 o'clock in the morning, almost 2 o'clock in the morning, some people came upstairs to use the bathrooms that were right there. And they saw people falling out under the power of God. So these people from whatever country they were in, the bar was downstairs. The whole bar was downstairs full of people getting drunk. And he comes over and said, what are you doing to these people, making them fall on the floor? And I was so drunk by that time, I just said, here. I said, it's Jesus. Put my hand on his forehead. Put my hand on his wife's forehead. They both laid out on the floor. When they, got, when they came to, I was still praying for other people. All of a sudden, the entire bar downstairs, they went down and said, hey, everybody, you need to go upstairs. It's where the action is all of a sudden at 1.30 in the morning, the entire bar comes upstairs, and I'm praying for people until 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> Pastor Layton says, you never did get back on. I said, I'm sorry, Pastor Layton. So then he said, will you pray? So the African guy was supposed to preach the next morning. And he said, the African guy said, you know what, sister? Take my Sunday. Take my Sunday. Service started at 9 in the morning. Nine. You got it? I got through praying for everybody at 7.30 that night. Nobody left. Wall to wall. 7.30 at night. 9 to 7.30. So I thought the service was over at 7.30, that I left the building at 7.30 because I'd prayed for people since 9 in the morning. So I was hungry, and I said, take me to a restaurant. I want to eat Jamaican food. I'm almost ready to wrap. Start playing, Kathy, please. Just, I'll be nice. Just we play whatever. We can't put music over the air. What? We can't put music on YouTube. You can't? Okay, whatever. I don't know what she meant. But anyway, I'm almost done. Okay, if you have to wait for me to get off so you can play, uh, whatever. Like. Oh, well, turn the camera off. No, you can't do that. No. <laughs> okay. It don't matter. All right. Don't worry. I'll just, I'll just pray for people without music. Okay. I mean, Jesus did it. He didn't have anybody following him around. Okay. So anyway, so here, here's, so we, we get to the restaurant. I'm tired. I've been preaching all day long and the night before all night. And I get to the restaurant and two guys are outside beating each other up. And I went out and I said this. They were cussing each other and slugging each other. I said, does your mom know you act like this? Would you stop hitting him? 
you'd stop. I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'm not going to allow this. And they called me blank, 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 blank. I said, you watch your mouth. Do you know I need to get a bar of soap and clean your mouth up? And I was telling these two off, and I said, I'm, I'm going to pray for you and cast the devil out of you and blah, blah, blah. And so the one says, and he cussed me out and went downstairs. The other one, when I told him I was a minister, he, he, he took his hat off and went, go ahead. And he put my hand on his head and said, go ahead and pray for me. Now, he had to be Pentecostal to have to do that. And so what happened is the revival just kept going the rest of the time because before I knew it, they were playing poker downstairs. I went down to go to the bathroom, and all of a sudden the poker people came up they, with their beers in their hand. I got the guy. He had a guitar, and we started singing Christian songs. He didn't know how to sing, and we ended up turning the whole restaurant into a revival. Oh my That's revival, people. When the Holy Spirit just takes you, and you know what? The day, and we were there a week praying for the firemen and the policemen and everything. And we'd start in the morning, and you know, it would be midnight, and we'd realize something. Now, wait till you hear what we didn't realize. We'd all get in the car and start be heading back to Beverly's where we stayed. And Mary Jo would say, Did we eat today? And I go, Did we? You know what? There's a realm in the spirit. I'm telling you the truth. There's a realm in the spirit when you're doing the Father's will that the last thing you think about is food. We had more energy. It was like we had an energy bunny just and the atmosphere of heaven. Are you ready for that? So I'm going to pray for people tonight. I'm going to pray for everybody tonight in Jesus' name.